Hey there, Knicks fans. <laughs> How you doing? It's your boy, John of the Macri with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Uh, you know, it's an important guest when they uh, have have joined us from a fancy, fancy hotel room where they are on location. They're on the ground um, to cover what we hope. We hope, we hope, we hope will be a uh, thrilling and enjoyable conclusion to what has been, uh, I think, for Knicks fans, a very enjoyable series. So live from Cleveland, Ohio, Fred Katz of The Athletic. Hello, Fred. I'm actually not here to cover the game. Is there something else? What happens in Cleveland besides occasional sporting events? Well, work, work, work. I'm here on my own dime. Uh, it's, it's an official meeting of the, the Dean Wade Deep fan club. Yeah. And I paid for, you know, all six members to come out here and, uh, we're, we're, we're not even going to the game. We're going to, we're going to stand outside the arena after the game, wait for it to come out where all the players come out and try to get Dean Wade's autograph. It's going to be big. Yeah. The name of the fan club is Dean waiting for Godot. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be great. If, first of all, okay, either you sat and thought up that pun ahead of time, which makes you my favorite person ever, or you just thought of it on the spot, which makes you even better than you would have been had you thought of it ahead of time. There's no wrong answer. Unfortunately, these things just come to me. It's it's a depressing sort of mind that I'm trapped in. It's, it, AKA you're a writer um, and a damn good one at that. Uh, how I just one one question. How many of the members of the fan club are also also have the last name Wade or cats? <laughs> Actually, the other the other five members thought it was a Dwayne Wade fan club. They just they showed up. They didn't play in Cleveland. <laughs> they were really. Yeah, they were really. They saw D Wade. They were really disappointed. They thought it was really misleading. And and honestly, I think they're just too lazy to to go into their accounts and unsubscribe. Um, that's all it is. That's unfortunate. I mean, look, um, through the first two games of the season, actually, no, that's not fair because RJ Barrett was doing some nice things even before games three and four. I was going to say through two games, it wasn't looking that crazy that you were down on RJ Barrett because he was having his shooting struggles. But, um, you know, sometimes, John, you go on a podcast and you say words, you try to get cute. Yeah, you try to get smart, and sometimes you forget Occam's razor. The most obvious answer is usually the correct one. Sometimes you forget about that concept, and you say things, and you say a lot of words on podcasts and a lot of words in stories. Sometimes you say some really stupid ones, and uh, and I knew it was stupid when I was saying it too. I was like trying to convince it. You know, I was trying to be interesting, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't go well. And for those who didn't hear the last time I was on this podcast two weeks ago and we ranked the best players in the series, and I, I had Dean Wade a slot ahead of RJ Barrett because we were, to my credit, to my credit, we were assuming, or at least I was assuming, assuming health. full health. I was assuming full health. Uh, and uh, my logic was that he wasn't going to kill you on either side of the floor. He hasn't killed them on either side of the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I think he they are. You can't oh, say he has. They are a minus in his minutes, but this neither here nor there. To your credit, to your credit, um, someone who has uh, been a, a guest on the show and someone who you've been a guest on his show several times, uh, Zach Lowe, when he was talking about the series with Timmy Bontemps in their latest episode, um, actually mentioned Dean Wade by name as saying, you know what the Cavs need in this series? They need the healthy version of Dean Wade, except he hasn't been healthy for the majority of this of this um, season, which is why that, that was the assumption that I took into those rankings, which is why I did not have Dean Wade above R.J. Barrett. However, however, I did have R.J. Barrett quite low. I believe I had him 10th or, or whereabouts. It was not a high ranking, which is a good place to start. So I'm going to ask you this. is what is the biggest surprise to you um, so far in this series? And it could be a player. It could be a play style. Um, it could be a team's 
response to something, a team's lack of response to something, a coach, anything you want to go, any direction you want to take it. What is the big five, five games in? No, we're four games in four games in. What's the biggest surprise to you in Knicks caps so far? Biggest surprise. That's a great question. Maybe RJ, maybe RJ. I, I think he, it's the obvious answer. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. You know what? I wasn't saying if I had RJ below Dean Wade, then I got to say RJ is the biggest surprise because he's been great. I mean, it's three and four, he was legitimately great. And, and you know what it's always been for RJ? It's I've been a huge proponent of, you know, people talk about his shooting and how the shooting has to get better and all that. But but to me, and I know Tibbs feels this way, because the reason that I feel this way is because Tibbs talks about it like this. And it, it kind of made me realize this thought process, which is that the big thing for him is not necessarily the jump shot. It's his reads when he's going downhill. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I'm going to clip at some point, probably in a story later this week, especially if they end up winning game five and, you know, we have a bunch of days where I'm figuring out the next series. People talk about RJ has been very efficient inside the three point arc, especially for two straight games. Right. Yep. And people talk about, oh, he took good shots tonight. You know, he, he was great going to the rim, all yep. that kind of stuff. That's great. That's awesome. That's kind of how we think about basketball. I think for RJ, we should be talking about the negative, though, the inversion. We should be talking about he didn't take bad shots. Yes. And one thing that I've done is I've gone back and I've looked and I've seen, okay, RJ might have taken this shot out of this triple team, but he dumped it off to the big man instead. His reads in this series have been really good. Like there was even late in game four when the Knicks are coming down and they are running a pick and roll with a guard every or a guard or a wing every single time it's Brunson with a screen being set by either quickly or Hart or RJ every time they come down the floor and they ran the exact same play for RJ four straight times where RJ comes up he sets the screen off the ball for Josh Hart comes up and goes into a pick and roll on the right side with Brunson and they ran the exact same play four times in a row the first time Brunson gets trapped and Brunson dumps it off to RJ Karis Levert doesn't close out, which is what he's supposed to do. He gives him space. RJ puts up a wide open three. Fine with that. He didn't make it. Whatever. Absolutely wide open. He's got to take it. And it was so poetic because the very next possession is exactly why he's got to take it. Because the very next possession, the exact same play, and Brunson dumps it off to RJ again. And this time, Karis Levert actually closes out on him which I think he probably was not supposed to do, but he knows RJ went up last time and he's getting a little antsy and RJ sees him closing out and he hasn't even gotten there already. And RJ is just like, I'm off. And he takes off for the rim and he ends up getting a layup. And by the way, Mitchell Robinson did something which he's been great at all year, which is he sealed off Jared Allen in the paint on that one too. And RJ scoops it in and the decision-making has been so quick. It's been so good. Uh, he just doesn't look like the guy we saw in the regular season. And it's yeah, he's been great. He's been he's been I mean, all props to him. He 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 has changed the way that he's playing. He's also he's playing better defense than he did all year, too. He's been he's been I, good. I'm happy you ended the series. With, I'm happy you ended with the defense because I have a clip for um well, t today's newsletter when people are listening to this, where it was in the fourth quarter, I think it was in the fourth quarter, and um, RJ was it was a it, it was a not a true fast break, but it was like a, 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 in semi transition, and Donovan Mitchell had the ball on the like the near side, and he it was they were him and, and RJ was on him, and they were ahead of everybody else. And Mitchell stopped right at the position where he was close enough to the three point line where he could have taken a step back. And so RJ recognizing that like darts forward to, to put his hand, like to prevent that. And then Mitchell does what he does, which is instantly shift into I'm driving baseline and he had the room to do it. And RJ without missing a, a single beat, 
stride for stride with him, cuts it off, forces Mitchell into a shot. He probably shouldn't have taken because it was obviously early in the clock. Um, long to it missed. Like that's one on one defense, and like that's only part of the game. And I think his team defense has been just as good. Uh, it it begs the question. Like there's. <laughs> There's a reason you ranked him where you did. There's a reason I ranked him where I did. It's not because we hate RJ Barrett. It's because we've watched 82 games of basketball this year. This is not the same player that we watched. And I don't know. I don't know. Like, I don't know what changed. I don't not sure. I really care what changed, but I'm just, you know, what's interesting. Changed. What I'm connecting dots here. Okay. Connect. Uh, RJ got up and said after game Three after game three. Sorry, I'm I'm trying to remember the days. They're it's all, all it all blends together. We're in a I was blur. just looking for yeah. something about what I wrote about him. Was it after game one? Was it after game three? I couldn't remember. Right. So RJ said after game three, somebody asked him, "When did you realize that that you were feeling your shot?" And RJ like thought about it. You could see him thinking about it, and he said, "What day is today?" And he asked Greg Schwartz from Knicks PR, "What day is it?" He said, "Friday." And RJ goes, mm, "So Wednesday." And people in the room laughed. Yeah, I heard that yeah. because they thought it was a sarcastic response, and. RJ was like, no, no, I'm actually serious. Like Wednesday was when I knew. Nobody followed up on it. The next day of practice, I asked him, what happened on Wednesday? <laughs> why, why did you know that you had a, what a specific response? Like what, what happened on Wednesday? And he was like, I'm going to keep that secret to myself. Uh, I do know that his trainer, Drew, Drew Hanlon, came into town on before game, game three. I do know they worked on some stuff. I do know that he was at, it makes a lot of sense because he works with Joel Embiid too. And he was there in Brooklyn and comes and sees his guys in New York and Brooklyn. I do know they came in. I do know they worked on some stuff. Um, I'm sure that that helped some, but it's not like you're all of a sudden going to, yeah, you know, just, just completely change as a basketball player. I, I will say, his floor game was good in game one. He just couldn't hit. He was just two for 12. Like, I agree. I agree. He, he was good leading the break. He was good making the right passes. He had six assists in that game. Like he was good in that sense. The defense was solid. The defense was good in, in game two. Also, I think he's actually been good all defensively, all yeah, four defensively the a thousand percent. He's been defense good. has been, has been like, he's been a plus defender. Like you, you're seeing him defend and you're like, Okay, if this is the defender RJ Barrett's going to be like, and I want to, I want to get back there. to that in a second because I think uh, it's important. But keep keep going. Yeah, um, and, and it's a big reason why defensively they've just been incredible as a team in this series. Uh, it's it's a huge reason. He's he's a very big part of that. Uh, but his floor game has been good. Um, but the yeah, it's just amazing to see what we saw in the regular season and yeah, it, I. I I don't know the answer. RJ's yeah. very close to the vest with stuff. You know, he's very, very close to the vest. He doesn't like to divulge things. There's some players who just be like, yeah, here's what, you know, Mitch would probably be like, yeah, here's what happened. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, speaking of Mitch Robinson, I'm going to, I want to refer to, uh, so you wrote something uh, earlier today for, Actually, you probably wrote it last night, and then it was released earlier today for the Athletic, um, in which you spoke to a an, a an assistant coach who only spoke on the condition of uh, anonymity, uh, and you mentioned to him that you thought that uh, Mitch had been pretty good in this series. I, I believe you used the word extraordinary, yep. um, and the the assistant coach goes on to talk about some of the things that he's he's doing and and how well he's doing it and then actually use the opportunity to go on and praise some of the other guys that that kind of changed the game um in game 4 which I want to get to in a bit um but he mentioned that he is playing with confidence uh this assistant coach mentioned that Mitchell Robinson is playing um where he does not have to worry about a stretch big which uh is helpful um and you know it's a good series for him I know you have a take um, that maybe people will like better than your RJ take. Maybe people won't like better your RJ take, but I'm gonna I'm just gonna give you the floor. How do you think Mitchell Robinson has played in this series, uh, Fred? So after <laughs> after game four, I asked Mitch in the post game press conference, "Is playoff Mitch a thing?" That was you. 
Yeah, that was me. Who else? I didn't know that, that was you. I should have known that was you. I didn't. I should have even actually heard heard from the voice. But the voice you can't hear the voice always for the question. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it was me because it's like you know, it's it's Mitch. Like I wouldn't ask like Jalen Brunson is playoff Jalen a thing, but it's Mitch. He's he's Mitch. You know, you you want to set him up. He's probably going to say something funny if you give him an opportunity to. It was a funny it. spot, and he didn't. He didn't take. He 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 he. Uh, he was very clear the playoff Mitch is not a thing. He said I'm yes. just Mitch. Uh, but he was very funny and R- RJ was uh RJ seemed to really enjoy Mitch's response. He was he was like he was like really cracking up at the sitting right next to him. Uh because I know Mitch just makes RJ laugh really hard. Uh was he? but that's great. Oh yeah, RJ. I think everyone in that locker room is fully on board with made the concept of Mitch being hilarious. But uh I after I I went up to him. Well so I should say that was the last question of the press conference. He okay. said no playoff Mitch is not a thing. And then he said good job. I couldn't quite tell if he was saying good job to himself for stop stepping the question or good job to me and like trying to coax him into saying something like a quote. Because <laughs> you know me sensationalist reporter yeah. the second the press conference ends i said okay everything goes off he looks at me um for context my legal first name is matthew not fred mitch found this out as did isaiah hartenstein and the two of them only refer to me as matthew now they do not call me fred uh the press conference ends mitch goes god damn matthew and then walks out uh so i so i so i go out with them and I say, and I say, no, for real. I think I said, I said, Mitch, are you do you for real? Like, do you think you're playing your best basketball ever? Uh, and he said, no. And I said, really? What's the best you've ever played then? <laughs> this is and good. he said, and he said, high school. I I crushed those guys. I was like, well, these guys are much better than than the guys you played against in high school so i maintain i was like i think this is the best i've ever seen you play and he said really and i said yeah and he said thank you and i was like i think oh, that's nice. played. You like I, I i i think he's been yeah i mean look i i choose my words carefully i said extraordinary in that piece i very rarely use words like that in my writing i i, I think that aptly describes the way that he's played in this series defensively he's been amazing uh, he has been a one man defense. I, 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 I think he has been so good in the paint guarding Jared Allen, guarding Evan Mobley. These guys are, are awesome bigs and he mm-hmm. is destroying them. <laughs> he is wrecking them. Yep. Uh, he is ensuring that the Knicks have a 35% offensive rebound rate when he's on the floor which is insane. And he's ensuring they have an elite defense when he's on the floor. And I just look through, I look through the other players in the series and I'm like, is there any other individual in this series who is ensuring that his team is elite on one end of the floor? Like Jalen Brunson's been great, but the next offense has not been elite. Like you look at, you look at the half court offense rankings in the playoffs and but are both the two of the last three, I'm assuming? To last two. The well, Knicks, last two. Okay. Of the 20 teams that made it into the postseason, <laughs> yeah. the Knicks are averaging like 82 points per 100 possessions in the half court, which is dead last. Okay. And the Cavs are averaging like barely more, which is second to last. Um, which speaks to, by the way, how good the Knicks have been in transition or taking advantage of the of well, Cavs turnovers in transition. That to me, when you said to me, what is... Uh, What's oh, the biggest the surprise! That's another thing? candidate. That's another candidate. Yeah, that's what I considered saying. How many? How many points per hundred possessions do you think the Knicks are averaging after steals in this series? Points per hundred after steals. Um, well, the the leader, the league leader this year, I want to say was around. Was it like in the one forties or one fifties or something? Yeah, league leader was in like the one forties. Okay, is it is it around there? I'm assuming. 176. <laughs> when the Knicks get a steal, their <laughs> offense is the same offense as when Ray Allen went to the free throw line. <laughs> and 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 it's funny about that. 
some of the misses are glaring because some of the Josh Hart misses are like, oh my God, how does Josh Hart? I mean, it should be like mm-hmm. 200 points for 100 possession. They are scoring every freaking time that's, they get a that's steal. That's incredible. And that's the difference in the series right there. That is it. Yeah, no. They have been unreal in transition in this series, just destroying. And the Cavs are a good transition defense and they, they have wrecked them. Anyway, I'm getting back to this one thing now. No, when, hold on. I want to go back to the real, real quick. Yeah. And it's so yeah. funny because Thibodeau has been universally praised for all manner of things in this, in this series. The, the most untibsian thing in the world is uh, gambling on defense and, and generating steals on defense. It's been the same way since he was freaking assistant coach with the Celtics. And for this team to, which I wonder is that that's maybe something to dig into at some point is like, is this something they talked about ahead of time? Is this player just being opportunistic? I'd be curious about that. Anyway, sorry. I didn't want to. Honestly, I think part of it is Mitch. I think guys feel more comfortable. Yeah. I was talking about it quickly the other night. Guys can feel more comfortable digging into their man, taking another shading an extra way. Yeah. Shading an extra way somewhere. Like, like he was telling me, like, I feel comfortable knowing like I can take an extra step somewhere and maybe go for a steal. Cause I know like yep. they're going right to Mitch. So they're not scoring. There's no yep. way they're the worst case scenario here is they don't score and I don't get the steal. Uh, so, so I think Mitch playing at the caliber that he is, is, is helping them get steals for sure. Yeah. The stat that I was, I uh, wanted to say it's from uh, NBA university, which is a good Twitter account uh, through the four games, his rim, uh, his field goal percentage allowed at the rim is 22.4% worse than uh, expected uh, for all shots that he's defending, which is obviously the best in the playoffs. It's that's um, it's a big number. It's, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, look, I, I, I have been eviscerated on this podcast by you, by Andrew, me, by, Ro- by Robert Cross. <laughs> I for, you'll know what I have for a hot you. take. I've never eviscerated. I mean, John, I listened. You did. You did say that my content was worth one dollar a month and no more. <laughs> That's what you tried. <laughs> I heard it. I heard it, John. You're here. <laughs> you said it into a microphone. You recorded it. You put it on the internet, and I listened to it. And I heard it. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Anyway, and you know what? I yeah. deserved it. <laughs> and so I made a pledge that I was going to come on here and not make any crazy takes that can be thrown back in my face. And so here is a crazy take that's going to be thrown back in my face. Okay. I think Mitch has been the best player in the series. I, or 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 maybe the most important player in the series. Like that's he's he's the only guy who has whose pure presence has ensured that his team is going to be elite on one side of the floor. So the only pushback that I would have there um, is be <sighs> it's weird because part of the reason that the series is a rock fight is because of Mitchell Robinson and because the Cavs can also and, and on the other side of the floor, Evan Mobley and we should say Jared Allen, too, although I think Evan Mobley has been the more standout of the two of the two uh, pigs for Cleveland. Like that is the nature of the series because of them but because that is the nature of the series offense is at such a greater premium that what Jalen Brunson is doing well it may not be on equal footing as important as what Mitchell Robinson or as impressive as what Mitchell Robinson is doing in this series what Jalen Brunson has done and what Jalen Brunson is doing I think has an outsized impact and you take his numbers and he is you know whatever he's averaging 20 24 points a game and six or five assists or something. And he's shooting whatever he's shooting. Like it's not like, you know, Joel Murray in the bubble numbers. I don't know why that was the name that came into my mind, but whatever they're not. <laughs> he had a very good bubble performance, uh, especially against he, was, he was great in the bubble, but that was great. I mean, how do you go to that before? Like Michael Jordan? I, <laughs> my mind works in very strange ways. It's right? not, you know, like Danielle Marshall on that one night that he made 12 threes. I'll tell you that much. Oh my God! You down the rabbit hole? Podcast coming coming soon. Um, anyway, but long story short is what Jalen has been able to do offensively in the series, and the Cavs defense has something to do with that. And again, your interview with this anonymous assistant coach 
uh, spent a lot of time talking about that and and how the Cavs could defend him differently. And I think he kind of, the assistant coach we interviewed basically was ended up with like be a little bit better, be a little bit more proficient, you know, technically sound, you know, be on your P's and Q's, but like, you know, Jalen Brunson is going to Jalen Brunson. So I, I, yeah, I do want to give a, a tip of the cap to, uh, to, to Mr. Brunson here. Oh yeah. I mean, look, he's been, he's been great. I just kind of want a more shade, just like how, how important Mitch has been. It, it, it's, it's crazy how great he's been. If, if this is what, if he were capable of getting to a place and he's only 24, we know that he's capable of doing this because he's doing it. So we know he's capable. We're looking at it. We're seeing it before our eyes, four straight games against a really good team. He has been an absolute force defensively. If he were capable, if he were this on every single night during the regular season, he would be in the defensive year conversation. Yeah. He would be in defensive player of the year conversation. What did Ian Cantor call it? The d- defense, best defensive player, man. <laughs> the best defensive player. Uh, yeah, he yeah when Ennis when Ennis Cantor asked me if I was going to vote for him for best defensive player, man, I said Ennis, you don't even know what the award is called. <laughs> I wonder if Mitch knows what the, the award is called. He probably. Does. I think Mitch knows. Mitch I think knows. Mitch. I think Mitch would like would would be really. I, I would love to interview Mitch if he were in the conversation about how he feels about being in the conversation. Cause I'm sure he would have some thoughts. I think, and I would love to hear them. I think if, well, we don't all defense hasn't come out yet. So I shouldn't say this, but like, he, he's not going to, he's not going to be getting any all defense votes, but, but like, because he, I don't think he played enough games. And if he, if like you took the center's games tough he, too, yeah, like you're and, not getting them at center. So that was the second thing I was going to say the center position for essentially the entire time Mitch has been in the league. It's like, okay, well it's, you're really only competing for one spot because Rudy Gobert's in the league that this is the first year that that has subsided. But like in, in Rudy's place, it's like, okay, so we got, um, I mean, Brooke Lopez, Brooke Lopez, who bam, God, bam um, uh, Miles Turner. Been, I guess must, but I think Mitch is like, I think Mitch is even this year has been one of the top. I think he has an argument for being one of the best five defensive centers in the NBA. I think that's a pretty valid conversation. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the thing with Mitch has always been consistency. And I think he's way more consistent now than he was last year. And I think he was way more consistent last year than he was three years ago and so on and so forth. But the thing with him is consistency. If he can maintain if he can do this for 82 games, and maybe he can't, it's possible that he can't because like, look, the playoffs are a different beast for a reason. He might not be able to, he might just be physically unable to go this hard for 82 games. That's reasonable. That's true for the vast majority of NBA players. That's true for everybody in the NBA, except for like Russell Westbrook and Giannis Ndekumbo and, 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 Jimmy Butler, I guess, but even Jimmy steps it up in the playoffs. Like you think it's, Oh my God, that was the most insane thing ever last night. But, but, but like, you know, if he got to a place where this were him every night, he's, he's in the conversation. Like he's I right the, there. The the minutes also have to do it. Like we just saw a defensive player of the year winner who averaged and part of it is because he fouls a lot uh, was like 28 minutes a game or 29 minutes a game. Like, I bet you that could be a big part. Of it. I don't know. I, I would. It would. I agree with you. It would be really cool. I want to use this Mitch thing to transition to what is, I think, my most fascinating thing for not only the rest of this series, but God willing, um, beyond that. And I'm purposely choosing my words carefully here because I'm not counting any chickens. I'm not trying to do that. Uh, but I think how funny it is. And again, credit to the assistant coach that you spoke to for this. It's a great piece. Everybody. I'm only giving you snippets of it. Everybody go, go check out what Fred did today um, because he had an interesting line at the end or an interesting thought at the end. You brought up that the Knicks were 19th in defensive efficiency this year and the assistant coach kind of pushed back and was like, well, yeah, but if you watch them play and you watch their process, their process defensively is as sound as anything. And I, I think for however long the Knicks are going to be in this postseason. Their, the, the reason why they will have a chance or I guess not have a chance, but I think they will have a chance to be in games and win games, including potentially against some really good competition in the next round, 
is because of their defense and because they have a baseline now with at the center position, not only Mitchell Robinson, but and I know we've texted about this, so I know you think he's had a great series too. Isaiah Hardenstein. I don't know if you want to vamp on Isaiah Hardenstein for a second because he's been it's been awesome. He's incredible. Um, he's been everything they've asked of. Between those two guys at the center position, you're getting 48 minutes of that. Okay. And then you could throw out at the point of attack, Josh Hart. Hopefully he's healthy soon. Gwen Grimes, who I think defensively was when he played, I think he was pretty good. This version of RJ Barrett, that's pretty nice to have. And then the guy that the coach that you interviewed went out of his way to praise. I, I, I want to get, I should get the quote right because it was, it was pretty important um, where he called, he, we just couldn't say enough nice things about Emmanuel quickly. Um, and yeah, I'm such a huge quickly fan. I love him more after watching this series because he's playing such a different role than he plays in the regular season. And he's still thriving. He's talking about offensively. And then he said, if you watch the game defensively, he has changed it. Again, this is a guy who does not play center position. He's not even on the ball all that much other than when he's been guarding Darius Garland. And according to an assistant, an NBA assistant coach you interviewed, Emmanuel quickly has changed the game, changed the series defensively. I think they have a defensive backbone now where they could feel pretty confident going into pretty much every, every game that they play. I agree. They play really good team defense too. Man, they are just... Yeah. They're just all over the place. Yeah, quickly has changed it. I mean, look, when there was a play in the third quarter of game four, when the Cavs were just murdering the Knicks with pick and rolls, it was when Garland was on that run and the Cavs were coming back and they eventually take the lead and and Jared Allen gets the ball rolling into the lane and quickly was held on the weak side and quickly comes over and helps from the weak side. And he is just there before Jared Allen even gets there. And, and sometimes you don't have to be tall to be a rim protector. It was like the definition of 90% of defense is just being in the right place because he was there before Jared Allen and Jared Allen was just like, Oh crap. Couldn't get to the rim. Nick's got the ball back. And it was it was a great team defense play in the midst of the Knicks team defense totally falling off because Randall was on the backside well, of a lot of those previous pick you're, and rolls. You're, you're and taking my next rotating. You're taking my next question. Yeah, but keep keep going. Yeah, but no, I mean they just they defensively look in really good lockstep. I will say, I I agree with the assistant coach who I spoke to that the Cavs are a good matchup. The Cavs offense is a good matchup for the Knicks defense. And it's not just because Mitch doesn't have to guard any stretch bigs like you would if they played, say, Milwaukee in the next round, which maybe they won't now. Uh, uh, we'll see. Or 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 even the in the conference finals if if you get Boston or something. And and obviously Embiid is just impossible. No yeah, I was about to say, it means, I, I'm not sure what, what, what you pick your poison there. Boston's yeah, I mean, uh, stretch, stretch fives or the MVP. Just, I, I'll, I'll take Boston stretch fives, please. Thank you. <laughs> and I and, and never regret that decision ever. Uh, but I, uh, no, that's not a hot take. No. If I said I would rather face would r- Al Horford than Joel Embiid in the playoffs, that would be a hot take. But I'm not saying that. That would be guys <laughs> pr- pretty, pretty good. But uh, Luke Kennard, he, or not Luke Kennard. Oh, my God. Uh, Luke Cornett. That's a bad job by me. Yeah. Luke Cornett really scares me. <clears throat> exactly Horrify- horrifying um i i what were we talking about just now <laughs> we were talking about I their team de- so their team defense I, I, this yeah. is the point that i was trying to get to is if i'm the knicks right now and i'm trying to win trying to win this game trying to end this series um i am i think that because of brunson because what barrett is doing because Josh Hart is just somehow, some way, he like manifests himself into being such a helpful, good offensive player. Um, we can talk about that if you want. Um, because the centers are doing what they're doing again, Mitch getting into the offensive rebounding position, the whole thing. Um, like I think they have enough to do what they know they need to do on offense. I think, I hope, Fa- maybe famous last words. I think where they where, where they win this game and where they end this series is on the defensive end and. That is the part that worries me because, um, and this is the the last thing I was going to reference in the piece from today, 
you ask the the coach, like, what would you do if you're Cleveland? And he's like, I'd go with Julius Randle on the pick and roll. And if you go back and you watch that early third quarter when Cleveland scored uh, on, I believe it was 11 of 13 possessions, or yeah, 11 of 13 possessions. And I actually think it might have been better than that because I think there was an offensive rebound in there. And they scored after they got the offensive rebound. Uh, Knicks couldn't stop them at all. And it was just get Randall in the pick and roll. Or if Randall wasn't in the pick and roll, get Mitch in the pick and roll and know that Randall is not going to recover in time on whoever Mitch is leaving down low. But it was, it always came back to Randall, even on the, the one transition opportunity. There was, Rand, I think Randall, there's a clip going around on Twitter. Randall literally screened his own man, um, Josh Hart, who was like trying to stay with the offensive player. And, and like Randall was just standing there looking. This is worrisome to me. And I don't know how much you want to get into the Randall is he hurt? Is he not hurt? Like all that nuts. Like, so I, I'll open it up to you. Like, what are, what are your thoughts on this current situation? It's very weird. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I think he's probably hurt. Tibbs alluded to the fact that the ankle is still bothering him in his post game presser on and game four. Randall said today after practice that he's fine and that he's healthy, but that's what he always says. You know, he doesn't even tell people he's close with. That he's hurt like he really he, yeah he just keeps it he just he's always fine he's always good to play he always wants to play i think that's why tibbs likes him that's why tibbs always stands up for him because that's the most tibbsian trait you could possibly have nope i'm always good yeah like if, go. if i can walk i can play and one more quick thing i remember what i was gonna say before oh sure and it's okay. that the cleveland offense is a d de- is a good matchup for the Knicks defense in general beyond just Mitch because they don't have a big wing and the Knicks don't have a big wing defender. That's their biggest flaw in terms of defensive personnel. All of their best perimeter defenders are six, five or smaller. It's Josh Hart. It's Quinn Grimes. It's Emmanuel quickly. It's Deuce McBride. It's Mitch in the middle. Like those are all their, their yeah. best defenders. And the guys who I think they might have the most trouble with are say a Jason Tatum where he, he can shoot over Quinn or, Grimes or how about or a or Jimmy, Jimmy Butler. Butler. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the thing He's is, not causing any problems for anybody. <laughs> I mean, it is going to be, I guarantee you. Don't talk about it yet. I, I don't, I, 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 I don't want to put it out you're there. Right. I'm well, not I was it. just going to say, closed. if we get Jimmy versus Tibbs in a playoff series, I don't know whose heart will break first. I think it will be mine or Taj Gibson's. It's <laughs> can we get Taj? Can Taj like have a courtside seat for every one of those games? Yeah. Taj, Taj should have to, that those games should be announced by like, like forget about Breen. Sorry, Mike, you're phenomenal at your job. This isn't the series for you. It's going to be Taj Gibson and Luol Deng in the, in the booth. And that's just how we're doing this thing. I actually think Taj, I'm, I'm sure you've, You've been around Taj enough. I think he. I don't. I think he wants to coach, but I think he'd be pretty good uh, on 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 the mic after he. Sure, he would. He He's an absolute to. pleasure to interview. He's very smart. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure he'd be great. But he wa- he wants to be a coach. Yeah. And uh, shocking. <laughs> yeah, he wants to be a coach. And uh, I'm sure if Tibbs is still coaching, whenever I was about to say, <laughs> I'll give you one guess where his first job. Is. It's going to be just about the easiest job interview in human history. What's your name? Okay. It's going to be easier than the job interview for uh, Dolan to get the team from Charles Dolan. It's <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be even easier than that one. He's, okay, he's that getting was, in. That was good. That was good. He's getting in. But yeah, yeah they don't they they don't have like like look at this point somewhat undersells RJ because RJ has been very good defensively in the series. He's just been I was taking this game to another level. That was going to be my and pushback. Ideally. Yeah. RJ is that guy, but in the regular season, RJ wasn't their primary guy on on a Jimmy Butler on a on a Tatum. It was Grimes. Grimes and was guarding smart. the yeah. Grimes was guarding the other team's best player. Maybe maybe Tibbs evaluates it differently with the way that RJ is playing defensively now. Um, but I also think that could be a reason why we're seeing RJ do as well. He doesn't have to go up against a big or a, a big wing who's really threatening to him right now. Yeah. Uh, he, he he's he's kind of going up against. Uh, the guys who were at least based on his regular season performance were his peers and he's looked really, really good. He's outplayed them. So that would be a good test for him in another series, but we don't have to discuss that. Let's talk about Julius. What else you got on Julius? It's, it's weird. It's a I, weird situation. 
I just like, uh, it's a tough situation to evaluate. I think because again, the Knicks are, this has to be said, this team has won one playoff series in 22 years, the 22 previous seasons. So the notion that like, it is not a huge deal to figure out a way to win this series. It like, I, I don't know if anybody is thinking that, but like, it is a massive deal. Um, I'm look, we know Julius Randle is going to start the game. Like there's, there's no question about that. We know Julius Randle is going to start the game. We know he's going to play a certain number of minutes. I would assume he'll be better than he was in, at, in the third quarter, at least of game four. He was better earlier in the game than he was in the third quarter. But I just like, man, like this is a core piece of your team. And in my eyes right now, the weakest link on the New York Knicks is him defensively at the same time. And this is what I want to get your other opinion on with this. Then we could you know, finish up pretty soon is I do still think they need his gra- for as bad as he's been. And I went through it earlier today. There are um, six, uh, sorry, 40 players with a usage rate of, I'm sure if I remember this, uh, 22 or more, 22 or higher usage rate and uh, averaging at least 20 minutes a game in the playoffs. You want to take a wild guess where Julius Randle's effective field goal percentage ranks out of those 40 players? I'm going to guess he's last because I know he's shooting 32 from the field and 25 from three. You are correct. So, like, I'm just really curious what, I'm just really curious what Tibbs' leash is in this game. And I thought, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to your article one more time. I thought I, I thought I wasn't going to. The suggestion that the assistant coach made, which is fairly certain something I said earlier in the series, if not before the series, was get Julius going downhill towards the rim, get him good looks, and try to get him in there when Jared Allen is out of the game. And that is what happened in game one when Tibbs had the funky substitution pattern in the first half. He had him in when it was the Mobley only minutes. So, like, is there maybe a rotation ish solution to what we're seeing? I just don't know. And I'm it, it worries me. That's all. It just it worries me. Yeah. I think that's an interesting point with the rotations. I mean, I think ultimately for Julius, it's just going to come down to like, does he look the same? Like, yeah. I know Andrew mentioned it on your guys' post game pod the other night. And it was a great point that Chetty Osman was guarding. Julius for parts of game four and we saw even in game three we saw Julius square up Mobley and go at Mobley and get nothing right but we saw him squaring up Mobley and it looked like Julius Randall you know it looked like him but the ball wasn't going in but it looked like him and they weren't successful moves and it was bad offense you don't want to isolate against Evan Mobley. It's not good offense, but that's a decision Julius Randall would make. He's feeling himself. He's like, I'm Julius Randall. I don't give a crap who you are. I'm going to ISO on you. Yeah. He does it against Evan Mobley. He did it against Bam in that, oh that my God. game in Miami when he just, I mean, Bam on a bio, I think has a case for best defender in the whole damn league who, who he killed one-on-one in that game it was just blowing by him and, was he was extraordinary in that? That was the one where he hit the game winner in Miami, and that might have been his. For with, with all due respect to the fifty-seven point game, that it, it was a, it was one of the two that was a better game. That was a better game. Oh, it was absolutely a better game. But like the shot making, considering the defensive quality of Miami in that game, was that's what I mean. Like that yeah. was a more impressive performance, and he also hit an absolutely unbelievable game winner, which yeah. you know that that puts you. It puts you over the top. But with Julius, he had Chetty Osman on him and yeah. was just like, nah. He only like went at Osman one time. And 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 I put went at for the people who aren't seeing the video in air quotes because it was one dribble into a mid-range step back. Like it was normally Julius would be like in the high post being like, give me the damn ball. This guy is minced meat. There is no way that he has a chance on me. That is normally what we'd seen. And and it wasn't. And I just keep coming back to Tibbs' comments about how a lot of guys around the league would not be playing with what he's dealing with right now. Very obviously talking about the sprained ankle. He came back from to play in this series. Uh, And, and you know, 
there's a difference between making excuses and just giving reasons. You know, yeah. I, I, no, I don't, yeah. I, I think it seems a lot more likely that he's hurt than that he all of a sudden, four days after he said that he's the happiest he's ever been playing basketball his entire life, decided, you know what? Actually, I don't, I don't, I don't care about this team in the playoffs. <laughs> like, I, I don't, I don't think that's, that's on the table here. So, so I think he's probably playing hurt. He probably hurts to move. And that's why we saw the defense that he we saw, even though like, look, it's not like Julius is Josh Hart defensively in terms no, of, but level, like, but. he, he, we know when he notches it up a little bit, like he, it's, I love Benji has a good one, a good word for this. It's like when, actually, I don't even know if this is his word, but like when there's inertia, with Julius, it's death. Like Julius needs to be moving around. Julius needs to be active. You need to put him in situations where he needs to be active and moving. That's the good Julius Randall. And that was the opposite of what we saw in the in the third quarter of the last game, which I'll I'll like I wonder is there and here's the other thing, Julie, um Obi Toppin, again, not making an all defense team anytime soon, but like He's active. He's bouncing around. He's like hitting your, you know, the next rotation. He's good at that. He's something. He actually, you know what? Obi will make bad rotations. He made some good ones in game four. I, he, I, I thought actually he thought he played good team defense in game four. Wonderful rotations. And so I wonder if there isn't a scenario where tomorrow or tonight, as your people are listening to this, like Julius plays like I, I watch he he goes out there and plays forty minutes, but like I wonder if it's like, like Julius plays around twenty, Obi plays around twenty, and maybe Tibbs even screws around with the small ball with Hart or I I don't know which one you want to consider the four in that lineup, but like Hart or or RJ at the four. I don't know. I just think again, this is in all hand not not an all hands on deck game, but like I'll, I'll end with this: you've covered this team all year. Sitting here as a fan who has acknowledged that I have PTSD, um, many, 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 many years it g- have gone into that PTSD. I am feeling, from my position, a sense of urgency to win this game because I fear getting tight at home in a game six with the prospect of a game seven hanging over their heads. That is me. You are around the team. Do you, do you get the sense that, like, like how big do you think? Like, how do you think they're approaching this game? How do you think they might approach like a game six if they lost this game? Like, what do you what do you what do you think their mindset is right now? John, you're gonna make me sound like Tibbs. Oh boy. I I just they're a very even keel team. When everyone's freaking out around them, they're just like fine. When everyone was freaking out about how Cleveland had figured them out, figured them out after game two, after game two, yep, they were like, "No, nah, it's a game. We're good. Forget about it. Move on to the next one. We got it." And they meant it. Uh, so when, I have uh, th- th- well, they they said the things, but you so you think they meant it and they believed it? Well, yes, because let's just go by their actions, not their words, because that's a sports cliche. Uh, yes. You know, put it in the past, move on to the next one, one day at a time. It's my actually my least favorite cliche in 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 of all the random post game cliches. It's my least favorite one. But let's just look at this team. Let's look at what happened the day after they had that horrific Dallas game on December third. That's true. Let's look at what happened the immediate road trip after. They had that horrific Oklahoma City loss at home, which actually wasn't that horrific because Oklahoma City ended yeah. up being pretty good. But yeah. what we thought was horrific and everybody was freaking out and was like, oh, no. And they're going to the West Coast and and Nick's film schools picking them to go own five on their West Coast road trip. And then they go to Denver and they win in Denver and they go to Utah and they win in Utah. When Utah's around, playing yeah. good basketball other way around. Sorry. Yeah. I blacked out that road trip. It was That's high okay. altitude. You could even so, throw in the other Dallas game where they lost the Dallas game in the most heartbreaking fashion ever, and then were clearly still mentally and like emotionally exhausted against the Spurs. But then after that, they picked it up and they won. I think s- several straight games. Yeah. Yep they 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 really do put it in the past. Like we just we see it all the time. So mm-hmm. I, I just I, I I think this is a that's a Tibbs thing, and and for what it's worth. This is a thing that needs to be said. Tibbs is an adjuster now. Look at all the adjustments in this series. Yeah. Like, come on. Yeah. I mean, look, I all we hear, oh, you know, Tibbs, he just wants to do, he just wants to do, you know, his his normal Tibbs 
defense stuff they did in the regular season and this normal, uninnovative Tibbs offensive stuff they did in the regular season. Please, they are is Kevin O'Connor from the Ringer tweeted or out a piece, yeah, 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 or, or wrote I should say yep. uh, that fifty two percent of their screens in this series have been set by non big men. In the regular season, it was 12%. They're so basically setting five, four and a half times as many screens with with guards as they are with big men now. And and it's working, by the way. Yeah. It's what they do all of crunch time now. That all the fourth quarter. That's all they yep. do now. And it works. Uh and their and their guys are executing it. Uh the just just even like little tiny things. Uh Quentin Grimes, for example. First two games of the series, uh, Donovan Mitchell was killing Grimes on really rejected pick and rolls. Rejected pick and roll, for those who don't know, is when you know the screen comes up on the left side, so Mitchell dribbles to the right side. You dribble to the opposite side of the screen. And and the scheme had had Grimes fighting over the screen. That's what he was supposed to do often because Mitchell, if you go under the screen against him, Mitchell's a normal length screen, then Mitchell's just gonna pop a three in your face and and it's bad defense. So you got to go over the screen against Mitchell and the the guy guarding the screener has to come all the way up, right? And what you'll do when you go over the screen is you'll try to feel out the screener with your backside. So that way you can just kind of turn around him. It's a lot harder for him to screen you that way. And you can get him to set some moving screens that way. The problem is Donovan Mitchell loves rejecting pick and rolls. He does it all the time and he's great at it. And he's got amazing timing. And my goodness, I think he has developed maybe the he's certainly up there in the tier one of the best footwork of any guard in the league. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I, I don't know how many guards have better footwork than him. I don't know if any guards have better footwork than him. His footwork is obscene. The way he's able to put the step backs that he pulls off, yeah. the way he goes around screens, his footwork with the ball is insane. Like I've actually watched him take batting practice with a wood bat at the Mets single A affiliates park. And he's amazing at baseball. Like he was like crushing home runs out of a minor league park with a wood bat. And thinking about it now, I'm like, of course he's amazing at baseball. This dude is so coordinated. It's it's the coordination it takes for him to pull the stuff off that he does is unreal and and a lot of basketball players don't have that like you've seen paul pierce throw out a first pitch it doesn't look good <laughs> paul pierce is but, jerky jerky yes exactly um but so grimes was feeling out the screen with his backside which is a conventional thing he wasn't messing up that's 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 what you do mitchell was killing and rejecting screens though and i know a big thing for for grimes heading into game three was like stop getting beat when he rejects those screens. So what did Grimes do come out game three? And I don't know if this was a Grimes thing. I don't know if this was a coaching staff thing, but it was something that I noticed. Grimes all of a sudden game three is now angling his feet differently. He's not letting Mitchell go to the opposite side of the screen. Instead of feeling out the screener with his backside, he's feeling it out now with his hand. And when Mitchell rejects the screens, Grimes is staying with him. Tiny little adjustment, but an adjustment. Something you're not really going to see during the regular season because you don't have the time to come back no. after two games and play a third game and be like, okay, here's what I can do now in order to stop this from happening. And it worked. Mitchell couldn't couldn't get that to go. And he made some incredible shots against Grimes that Grimes defended well, but that's just what great players do. Uh, they have made big adjustments, like the screen stuff. They've made big adjustments, like, I don't know, not playing Julius Randle for an entire fourth quarter. Has that ever happened no. in a close game under tips? No. Uh, they've made they've made those big ones. They made the little teeny tiny ones. They've they've thrown different kinds of coverages at at Mitchell, different kind of coverages at at Garland. Uh, they are extremely prepared from a tendency standpoint. I, I can't really remember a time like I guess there were one or two plays in Cleveland. It might have been in Game Two. Uh, where oh no it was game one where they closed out on a coro and they shouldn't oh yeah and it hasn't really happened since like from a scouting report from a know your personnel perspective 
they've been so good on that. They're clearly so prepared. Uh, Tibbs has been a big part of why they're up 3-1 right now. I, I think just the narrative around Tibbs is always he doesn't adjust. He's stubborn. He's going to do the same thing all over again. It takes him too long. It's like that is not the case at all. That couldn't be farther from the case in this series. Couldn't be farther. Well, we just went through over close to an hour's worth of very rational, um, well thought out and explained reasons why the Knicks have been successful in this series. And yet the last thing you just talked about, which is Donald Mitchell being really good. Uh, if there's a way that this series goes sideways, I have a funny feeling it's going to be because that guy decides to have um, a stretch of games and, um, and do what he's capable of doing sometimes. I hope that is not the case. And even if it is the case, I wonder if the Knicks can't withstand it, which I think they're good enough that maybe they can. Um, they won game one, so that's a good sign. But and they and they won the previous game in Cleveland when he went off for whatever he went off for, forty two points. So it's not like they can't do it. Um, but we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens uh, on Wednesday night. I'm excited. I'm nervous. Um, but yeah, any anything else from you before we before we get out of here? I mean, yeah, Mitchell. Mitchell could go off the last three. That could be a way, or 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 it could be Dean Wade. <laughs> it could be Dean Wade. It could be Dean could Wade. Be I know his fan club is rooting for that outcome. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> Fred Katz, can you let anyone? The fan club maybe, doesn't even what? know. The fan club is like, I thought Dwayne Wade retired. They're not even good Dwayne Wade fans. That's the thing. I wonder if they, they accidentally signed up for a Dean Wade fan club, so they couldn't even be good Dane, Dwayne Wade do you, fans. Do you think that they watch the uh, the show that Dwayne Wade hosts? It's like some kind of a oh that that cube game show. What's it called? Yeah, there you go. I don't. It's, it's I've, not I've, good. Would never. Oh, you watched it? I have watched it. Sometimes it goes on after uh, what's it on TNT, right? I I um, I usually turn off the the TV after basketball is over. So yeah, I think it goes on after basketball sometimes. Okay. It goes on I'll after have... something, and I've kind of left it on. I've watched. It's not very good. I n- not shocked. Um, Fred Katz, can you let folks at home know where they could find uh, you and your extra- extraordinary? Don't say that word lightly. <laughs> extraordinary content. Yes, my uh, extraordinary content, which is worth all of a dollar. You can get at theathletic.com. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Fred Katz. Um, subscribe to John's newsletter. I, it is, it is, it is, it is worth the the forty cents that I'm telling you it's worth. I'm telling you, it really is. You're, Fred Katz is got that is worth far more than a dollar. I want that noted for the record. Uh, that's true. It's I worth a dollar a month. A dollar a month. If you're coming oh yeah, that's to a year, right. Dollar a month makes it worth twelve dollars. Seriously, if you're not subscribed to, the, I said this all the time. Yeah. If you're not, I think we're running. The, I think we're running a two dollar a month deal. You can you can click on any of my stories and sign up there. Uh, we we have like if you're just like a New York sports fan, like our Yankees coverage. I'm a huge Yankee fan, as people may know. Like our Yankees coverage is awesome. Our Mets coverage is really good. Our Jets coverage is great. Like it's worth it's worth it, even if you think I'm terrible and you just don't want to hear anything about about dean or Dwayne wade and the you're not terrible uh there's a, a perhaps a, a take you'd like to have back but you're not terrible um and this is exactly we all, we all have them, we we all all have have them. it's, it's just have them. it's such a bad take it's a, like it's like it's like a horrific take like it's right up there with like mission accomplished it is it is a horrific take that's a, that's a in history, but it's it's, it's really a, gone poorly. It's listen, you never know. It, it, there's a lot of series left to be played. Um, it's a great time of year to be subscribed to the Athletic because, um, like as the series dwindle down and you get to you know four series and two series and finals, like the in depth coverage, um, you know, and just like I don't know, I'm uh, like you know what I'm gonna do as soon as the t- like the Timberwolves are playing tonight. As soon as their series ends, I'm gonna go right to John Krasinski and read what he has to say about them because he's awesome and like does great oh, work there. He is uh, the best in the business, in my opinion. He's oh man, he's really good. Best B writer in the business. Not I, not I, I the praise. actor John Krasinski, to be clear. Yes. Um. Yeah, yeah but just like Rolls B writer. He is but he's just he's he's one amazing. of a collection of guys that you have. No, and, he, oh. and he's it's it's great. And and if you're an NBA fan, you're gonna you'd love all this stuff. Okay. Um subscribe to the athletic, uh, follow Fred Katz on Twitter, 
And uh, do, do, do. I think that's it. Um, check us out for uh, post game, pre game, uh, post game. Yeah, post game tonight after the game five. Hopefully, a celebratory one. Uh, until then, we'll talk to you later. Peace out.